hand him over to you and he will speak for 45 minutes and then the rest of the hour will be used for Q&A. And uh, Steve, where are you? I am in Coral Springs, Florida. You're in Florida, okay. At, at, at sea level, which is the important thing for me. <laughs> okay. Um, Steve Wise is the president of the Non-Human Rights Project, which is an American civil rights organization dedicated to obtaining fundamental legal rights for non-human animals. He has <coughs> animal rights jurisprudence, jurisprudence, I'm sorry, jurisprudence at seven law schools, including Harvard and Stanford. And on a personal note, I'd like to say that he and I have been colleagues for two or three decades now, it must be, or give or take, and uh, I have a great deal of respect for him and his, for his work. So it's a great honor for me to introduce to you Steve Wise. Thank you very much. Um, again, I just want to quickly apologize for not being in person. Uh, alas, I had suffered some respiratory problems in the last couple of months, and uh, when I arrived in uh, Mexico City, uh, I was not prepared for the altitude and the pollution, and they kind of did me in, so I had to come home. But uh, now I'm, I'm now ready to go. So as, as much of the work of the Non-Human Rights Project is litigation, and uh, journalists often report our story in a binary way. Um, you know, we win, we lose, but um, merely reporting whether the Non-Human Rights Project wins or loses uh, any particular case or any five cases or ten cases uh, fails to capture the enormity and the complexity and the range of the struggle that the Non-Human Rights Project has begun. So its object is to attain legal personhood and those fundamental legal rights for non-human animals to which generally accepted principles of justice entitle them. And the decisions of individual courts in the United States and throughout the world along the way uh, merely can help or hurt us, but their, their power to do so is dwarfed by impersonal forces that are both strong and growing. So let's begin at the beginning of the problem. So for more than 2,000 years, uh, Western law has bifurcated all entities either into persons or with the capacity for legal rights or things who lack that capacity. So I have this wall, and on one side of it are the things in the world, and the other side are the persons of the world. And uh, right now, all non-human animals are on the thing side of the wall. All human beings are on the person side of the wall. But this is not how it's always been, and the wall is, is semi-permeable. So that uh, at one time, uh, say 250 years ago, all the non-human animals of the world were on the thing side of the wall, but there were millions and millions of human beings who are also on the thing side of the wall. Uh, and indeed, a, a great deal of the civil rights uh, work of the last two and a half centuries has been struggling to move all of the human beings on the thin side of the wall to the person side of the wall, whether they were women, uh, slaves, Native Americans, indigenous peoples, um, children. So, one of the problems that the Non Human Rights Project tries to deal with in advance is. To, to disabuse judges before whom we appear of the idea that uh, persons, those who have, who have legal cap the capacity for legal rights, and humans are somehow spinning in. And it's, it's not easy for us to do that. Uh, they, on the, also, on the person side of the world, uh, right now are human beings, but uh, as I've said before, at one time they weren't all human were out there, and there's always been entities who are not human beings. Uh, corporations, uh, ships, uh, counties, you know, probably the state of Mexico for many uh, many uh, purposes is not a, um, it is, it is, is a legal person. But of increasing importance is the idea that there are other entities who are also legal persons, meaning that society says that they ought to to have the capacity for legal rights. Um, in New Zealand, for example, in, in the last couple of years, um, a, a river, the Wanganui River, 
has been designated a legal person. Uh, the, there are two national parks who have been designated legal person. Um, in India, uh, in the last, you know, over the last 80 years, a mosque has been said to be a person, a Hindu idol. Um, in 2000, the uh, Supreme Court of, the, of, of India held that the Holy Books of the Sikh religion you know, is a legal person. Uh, earlier this year, uh, there was a case in which a judge held that the Ganges River uh, was a legal person. That has been reversed at least temporarily, and now it's in appeal to a, a um, higher court. So there has been this struggle to move um, entities who are legal things, who lack the capacity for rights, to the other side of that wall, uh, where they will be um, legal persons. Now, the manner in which the personhood of formerly legal things has been finally established in the courtroom you know, is indeed a model for the 21st century work of the non-human rights project. Now, um, Edith Hamilton, who was uh, arguably the premier classical scholar of the mid 20th century, reminded us of the first turning point in the struggle to abolish human slavery. Uh, the words that she described, the status of human slavery in ancient Greece, you know, resonate today with the modern legal world that excludes all non human animals from being person. With even such uh, cognitively complex and autonomous beings as chimpanzees or elephants or orcas, and from eligibility for even the most fundamental legal rights. And so Edith Hamilton said that, that when the Greek achievement is considered, what this must be remembered is that the Greeks were the first to think about slavery, about human slavery. And to think about it was to condemn it. And so by the end of the second century, 2,000 years before the American Civil War, the great school of, of the Stoics, which is the most widely spread of the Greek philosophies, uh, was denouncing human slavery as an intolerable law. And so the personhood of all nine, of all human beings has not been won. Everywhere, all human beings have the capacity to rights. And human slavery itself is an international crime. And so it's now time, as far as non-human rights is concerned, to turn to another intolerable law, which is the continuing, continuing rightlessness and the slavery of all non-human animals. An initial task of the Non-Human Rights Project, then, is to encourage judges, almost always for the first time, and then persistently to begin to think about the injustice of a legal thinghood of all non-human animals. And so to think about their thinghood and their slavery is limited as well. So for those who've never thought it possible, the required psychological shift begins with imagining, being able to imagine, that an entity that has long been considered a legal thing can possibly be seen as a legal person. Now, those of us who work at the Non-Human Rights Project you know, understand what Winston Churchill meant when, uh, after the British triumph over the Nazis at the Battle of El Alamein in 1942, after losing a lot of battles, he said that it is not the end, it's not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. And the end of the beginning is the initial goal of the work of the Non-Human Rights Project. For us, the end of the beginning is helping judges to imagine at least that some non-human animals need not be the legal things that they've always been for 2,000 years, but as the legal persons that they're becoming. And then to persuade those judges to begin to establish a legal personhood, their capacity for legal rights. Now, then the road to fundamental legal rights, at least those non-human animals, will open, and the struggle will shift from the end of the beginning to the beginning of the end, of the automatic legal finger of every non-human animal, and on the flushing out of the specific rights to which justice should entitle each species, each non-human animal. So how can a non-human rights, non rights project accomplish this end of the beginning? Well, we prepare to litigate our cases first by studying the fundamental values and principles, and they usually include liberty, autonomy, equality, 
fairness along with rational and, and a dedication to rational and non-arbitrary decision making for the courts of a target jurisdiction that they themselves claim constitutes justice. And so when the non-human rights project is trying to choose the jurisdictions in which it, which it wants to litigate in these early years, we choose jurisdictions that in which the judges do come out and explicitly say that they do value liberty, they do value autonomy and equality and fairness and rational and non-arbitrary decision making. And the Non-Human Rights Project spent seven years uh, looking at uh, the, the uh, court system in 20 English speaking states and all 50 American states in order to look at those jurisdictions and try to identify them in which the judges themselves understood the concept of justice you know, in, in those terms. And so once we had chosen our jurisdictions, and the first one was the state of New York in the United States, the second in the state of Connecticut in the United States, uh, the third one is likely to be the state of California uh, in the United States. So the next thing that we do is that we choose a cause of action, which means the kind of, you know, the reason that we're in court. So, for example, if you enter into a contract with someone and you breach it, you might, the cause of action for a lawsuit would be breach of contract. If somebody negligently runs you down on a road and injures you in an automobile, and you would sue that, the cause of action would be negligence. So, we chose a common law cause of action of criminal corpus. Now, we chose the common law, uh, and the common law is the heritage of every English-speaking country. So we chose the common law because it's inherently flexible. It's supposed to keep up with the times. It's supposed to keep up with advances in science, with advances of, of uh, moral thinking, with advances in human experience. So we wanted the judges not to have to interpret a statute that someone else wrote, or not to interpret a constitution that someone else wrote, and they use the word person, so the judge would have to think, well, what did the legislature mean when it used the word person? Or what did the constitutional convention mean when it used the word person? Instead, the common law is the law that judges actually make in English speaking country. And so our argument to them is that you judges have made the law, the law that all non human animals are legal things who lack the capacity for. Um, rights, now you can unmake it, and then we're going to give you all of the arguments and all of the facts um, that, that you know, based upon the, uh, the ideas of justice that you, you, you yourselves, judges, say that you believe in, uh, and we want you to then use that to begin to move some non-human animals from the, from the uh, uh, category of things who lack the capacity with the rights over to the category of, of um, persons who have the capacity for rights. And we chose the writ of habeas corpus, which I gather from speaking to my friends in Mexico does not exist, but there's something called an impara, which is roughly equivalent, and we've also run across that in, in, uh, when we work in Argentina. And so a writ of habeas corpus means is Latin for you have the body. And it means that, that uh, someone is detaining against their will and wrongfully, you know, somebody else. So it's a very ancient writ in, in the common law countries. It's perhaps 300 years old. It's extraordinarily important. One of the reasons that we choose it is because the judges make clear that it is a fundamental, fundamentally important legal concept. The idea that a human being might be deprived of her liberty by being detained against her will is something that makes judges sit up and notice and may want to be able to deal with it immediately. It also generally um, does away uh, or ameliorates uh, the problem of, of standing, which uh, animal welfare lawyers, which I've been on my whole life, um, until I became a, a civil rights lawyer who works hard, who focuses on the, on the civil rights and legal rights of non-human animals, which is what the non-human rights project does, we would oftentimes be dismissed from court for lack of standing, just as environmental groups uh, oftentimes are as well. And 
usually courts will, not, will have a much relaxed or even not any requirement for standing at all because standing means that the only person who can file a lawsuit is the injured person. Well, obviously, someone who's being detained against the will by somebody else is not going to be let out of detention to go to a court to seek a writ of habeas corpus. But some third person generally finds out about this, goes into court, and demands that this person being detained be freed and that the jailer be forced to come into court to give a legally sufficient reason for detaining the third person. And so the courts will generally say, well, you don't need to have standing to do that if you're the person who's coming in telling us that someone else is being detained. Another thing, habeas corpus is generally very quick. Um, in our New York cases, sometimes the cases are over in the, on the very first day we file a suit. But they could be over in a week or a month or two months. But generally, uh, they don't take one year or two years or three years. And they also d depend upon the idea of, of Someone being deprived of bodily liberty, which the judges agree, is an extraordinarily important interest to indicate. So we also look at those uh, jurisdictions in which they in which they value liberty, and liberty um, is what's called a non-competitive right. It's the kind of right to which you're entitled just because of who you are, um, without comparing yourself to someone else. So equality, for example, is a competitive right in which you're entitled to some right because you're like somebody else who has that right. And the liberty right means you're entitled to a right because of who you are in some way, whether anybody else in the universe has that right at all. At, at all. And so we saw that many of the judges um, were extraordinarily interested in the idea of autonomy, especially in the last 30 or 40 years. So, for example, in the state of New York, in the state of Connecticut, and in California, and more likely in the state of Mexico as well, um, you, you had people who were um, who were being hospitalized, for example, and they would die unless they had certain surgery or unless they had um, medications. But they didn't want the medication. They didn't want the surgery. They preferred to die. And so, the hospitals would then go into court and say. We want you, you know, judges, to overrule the autonomy of our patients and give us the authority to force them to have the surgery or force them to take the medication in order to save their lives. And beginning in the early 1980s and late 1970s, the courts everywhere began to say, no, we're not going to allow you to override their autonomy. If they wish to die, then, then you will let them die. And it's not in the interest of the state to go in and do anything. In other words, as far as the state was concerned, their autonomy was more important than their life. And so we, uh, we remember that. And, also, and so we then look for non-human animals who we believe we can show our autonomous. And uh, one thing I want to emphasize, because many people don't understand our litigation, um, is that when we go into court and argue that an autonomous being like a chimpanzee uh, or an elephant or one day an orca, uh, that they should be able to be the person with the right to bodily liberty protected by the Rita Papers Corpus, that we are not arguing that autonomy is a necessary condition for personhood. We argue that it's a sufficient condition. So we don't need to be autonomous. There are obviously other reasons that might be granted, that might allow you to be a legal person. But if we can prove to the court that we are autonomous, then that should be sufficient for you at least to have the right to bodily liberty that's protected by a limitative purpose. So that explains why we, we've gone out in the first years of our litigation, the first four and a half years, to seek uh, non -human, to, to seek non-human animals who we believe that we can prove are autonomous. And in order to do that, we've gone to, when we work with chimpanzees, you know, to the premier chimpanzee experts around the world, in uh, Japan, Sweden, Germany, England, Scotland, the United States. And the same thing when we're, we're advocating on behalf of elephants. Uh, those experts who are with, like Joe's Cool or Cynthia Moss, um, who have spent decades studying 
elephants, we go to them and ask if they will help us. And, and, that's, and those are the people who go to to file affidavits that lay out in great, great detail you know, exactly why and how the, the elephants and the chimpanzees are autonomous. And uh, I urge you to go to our website, which is nonhumanrights.org, and look at our litigation. Take a look at the affidavits. They are done in excruciating detail. Uh, the chimpanzee affidavits in our last cases are, are 160 pages long. Uh, perhaps nowhere else has all of that evidence about the autonomy of elephants, of chimpanzees and also of elephants, has it ever been uh, in one place? So, so we, we then argue that autonomy is a value that you the core value, and we're going to show you facts in spades that show that our non-human animal clients are also autonomous, and that a rich movie's corpus is meant specifically to protect autonomy, to keep anyone from, from being all imprisoned against you know, his or her will for, for an, an improper person. And I'm sorry, it's an improper reason. Now, not only do we argue that, that liberty is an important value, but we argue that, that equality is an important value uh, as well, un under the common law. In order to make that argument, we actually borrow from the constitutional law of the United States under our 14th Amendment, which has a, which has a clause saying that, that, uh, that persons have to, have to be treated um, with, with equal protection and that kind of equality. And so, the judges, um, generally, when they're dealing with the fundamental rights, like bodily liberty, for example, of a human being, or what's called a suspect classification, means that you're being you be discriminated against because of your religion, or your race, for example, your nationality, they apply a very strict standard. When they're dealing with something like some other kind of discrimination, they apply a very loose standard. But we argue that even under the loosest standard that they apply, that our non-human animals can still be seen as legal persons with the right to bond with liberty you know, as a matter of common law equality. And so that the very, very lowest, the very, the very base argument would be that uh, when a court is looking at a statute passed by a legislature trying to determine whether it deprives any group has been discriminated against a deeper protection under the United States Constitution, we we'll use the test. Did the legislature uh, pass a statute that discriminated, and was that discrimination a rational relation to a legitimate goal? And if it's not, then the court will strike it down as being arbitrary and illegal. So, is something a rational relationship to a legitimate goal? And so we go to the court and we say, well, we don't want you to be looking at a statute that a legislature passed. We want you to make the call that as a matter of equality, like chimpanzees or, or elephants or orcas, to our clients, you should have the fundamental right that is protected by, by uh, the common law rid of habeas corpus. And we argue that it is not a legitimate goal and can never be a legitimate goal for either a, st a statute or legislature or a court to, 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 to allow an autonomous being to be discriminated against so that she can be deprived of her autonomy. And we point to one United States Supreme Court involving the question as to what happens when a state tries, this is now 25 years ago, to strip gay people of all of their rights in our state of Colorado. And there, that, that the United States Supreme Court said that that kind of a constitutional amendment to the state constitution was at once too narrow and too broad. It identifies persons by a single trait and then denies them protection across the board. And we say by identifying our non-human animals by a single trait, they're not humans, they're elephants, their chimpanzees, and then relying on protection across the board violates basic ideas of fairness, basic ideas of equality. Now, when we bring this kind of a lawsuit to the courts, well, our approach leaves courts with four possible responses. The first response is that the court can, can simply uh, deny 
that liberty and equality and, the, and fairness and autonomy along with rational and not arbitrary decision making, they can deny that they're actually the fundamental values and principles that constitute justice as they see it. In other words, we made a mistake in believing that, that they did because we thought that's what they said. And if they say that, this response has the benefit of allowing an unhuman rights project to find nuances that then invoke the correct values and principles of that jurisdiction. However, no American court to date has ever told us that we made that error. So the second possibility is that courts can actually apply their stated fundamental values and principles of justice to the claims that brought that the non-human rights project brings uh, on behalf of non-human animals and recognize the person with the rights. Now, no human, no American court has yet done that either, although one New York trial court came very close, and you can actually watch it happen if you look at the HBO film about the work of the Non-Human Rights Project called Unlocking the Cage, and you can get that on HBO, you can get it on iTunes, some places on Netflix, um, HBO Go, and you can actually see uh, a judge come very close to actually implementing those values and finding in our favor. And based upon the litigation and you know, the ideas that we've put forward, it has been accomplished and was accomplished on behalf of a chimpanzee named Cecilia right in November 2016 in Argentina. And it perhaps has been accomplished in India. Um, the Indian Supreme Court is using certain, is using the word rights to talk to with respect to non-human animals. But we are not, we're not sure, we're kind of skeptical that they're using the word rights in a different way than, than we are. So we're still working on that, and we're working with folks in India uh, on, on that issue. So the third thing that can happen is that the courts of the Nami Yolan can narrow some or all of their fundamental values and principles of justice by insisting just ad hoc that these apply to all but only human beings and not to non-human animals. If this approach undermines justice as the courts themselves define it, or we wouldn't have chosen the jurisdiction. Now this might not in the short term have serious consequences to human beings, or as we shall see in a second, we may. Uh, but because as Martin Luther King Jr. said, you know, justice denied anywhere diminishes justice everywhere, the negative effects of courts making ad hoc determination of the rationale of the, of the fundamental rights of non-human animals will inevitably severely undermine the rationale for the fundamental legal rights of human beings as well. But perhaps, ironically, admit this, when this occurs, it may take this to occur, um, to, for this to occur before real legal change for non-human animals actually begins. Now, American courts have not infrequently passed through periods like this in which they've un initially undermined their own fundamental values and principles rather than acknowledge their application to, to human entities who have long been excluded from justice. So, for example, they once in the United States limited legal person and legal rights to white people and refused to grant them to black people. With the American, United States Supreme Court in a very famous case referring the black people as beings of an inferior order, altogether as unfit to associate with the white race, and so far inferior to them that they had no rights that the white man was bound to respect. Courts have also refused in the United States to grant rights to Chinese people, for example, with the California Supreme Court in the 19th century calling them you know, a race of people who nature has marked as inferior and who are incapable of progress our intellectual development beyond a certain point, as their history has shown. Courts in the United States limited certain rights to heterosexuals, refused to grant them to gays. In fact, in 1985, the United States Supreme Court allowed sodomy to be criminalized. And courts have limited personhood and legal rights just to men and refused to grant them to women. So, for example, uh, a woman named Lavinia Goodell tried to become a lawyer in 1886 in Wisconsin, the American state of Wisconsin. There the Supreme Court of Wisconsin refused her request solely because she was a woman and, she, and they said that the law of nature destines and qualifies the female sex for the bearing and nurture of the children of our race 
and all lifelong callings and women inconsistent with that are, de- are treason against nature, and they wouldn't let her become a lawyer. Even though the court seemed oblivious to the irony of its footnote that noted that Lavinia Goodell's lawyer had told them that it was she who had actually written his appellate argument before then. Now, it ended its decision by stating that if his counsel threatens these things are to come, women are going to be allowed to be lawyers. I mean, we'll take no voluntary part of bringing them about. But see, that didn't matter. That decision and others like it would soon be overwhelmed by similar kinds of impersonal forces that are pushing for equal rights for women from many directions. So today, some courts are again undermining their own fundamental values and principles of justice by limiting legal persons and legal rights to human beings and refusing to grant them to any non-human animals, no matter how complex the cognitive abilities are, and no matter how similar the human beings their cognitive abilities may be. So faced with the non-human rights project claim that imprisoned autonomous non-human animals like elephants or chimpanzees or workers are entitled to the fundamental right of, law, of uh, body liberty protected by the, the writ of habeas corpus, courts have dismissed our cases on grounds that would be questionable even as Lavinia Goodell did, if the non-human rights project, I'm sorry, if the non-human animals themselves had also written our appellate arguments, they would still not have rights. Perhaps the most unfortunate way in which a court determines its own fundamental values and principles of justice is when it grounds its decision upon its implicit biases. So present judges have been raised in a culture as we all have, that pervasively views all non-human animals as being trained. So as are most of their fellow citizens, judges daily and are routinely involved in the widespread exploitation of non-human animals. So they eat them, wear them, hunt them, engage in any of the other numerous exploitive ways that the culture has long accepted. So there's scientific evidence that when you think about humans, different clusters of neurons that subconsciously triggered, depending upon the degree to which we may identify with other human subjects. So imagine how differently a judge's neurons are triggering when they're looking at even a close relative of human beings you know, as a chimpanzee. So today, most judges are therefore likely automatically and unconsciously to be biased against the personhood argument that the non-human rights project presents, just as they're likely to be biased against are humans based on their race, their gender, their their sexuality, their religion, their weight, their age, their ethnicity, their scientific evidence that supports all of this. But because our minds have been shaped by the culture around us. In fact, our minds have been, as one person knows, they've been invaded by it. So the non-human rights project is therefore expected to encounter puzzling and oftentimes diverse reactions to our demands for legal personhood and the fundamental rights for non our non human animal claims in our early cases. And we have not been disappointed in that. So for example, one non human uh, one New York appellate court dismissed the habeas corpus case on behalf of a captive chimpanzee named Tommy on the ground that personhood can only be bestowed upon someone who has the capacity just not only for legal rights but they have to have a corresponding ability to bear duty. Now, the Non-Human Rights Project had argued that a person was an entity able to possess either rights or duties, not rights and duties. Now, what happened is that the, the court said, no, um, you're going to have to be able to, you're going to be able to get any rights at all. You have to be able to possess both rights and duty. And then they decided, without any evidence at all, that chimpanzees never could and never would be able to do that. So, probably the most serious you know, part of their argument, the, the weakness in their argument, was that when we pointed out that the obvious problem that millions of New Yorkers, since this was in New York, infants or children are severely cognitively disabled, but they can't bear duties either. But the court wrote, well, to be sure, some humans are less able than others to bear legal duties. But these differences don't alter our analysis, as it's undeniable that collectively, they use the word collectively, human beings possess the unique ability to bear legal responsibility 
So nothing in this decision should be read as limiting the rights of human beings, period. Now, in doing this, the court substantially relied upon an obviously incorrect definition of person that they found in something called Black's Law Dictionary, which is the law dictionary that's used most in the United States. And that did indeed state that persons had to be able to bear rights and duty. So when this seemed really strange, because that we knew that that was not the law. So the Non-Human Rights Project then brought uh, this error to the attention of the editor in chief of Black's Law Dictionary, who wrote him a, uh, an email saying, you know, hey, look, you're screwing up our litigation here by giving the wrong definition of person. And so he immediately acknowledged the mistake, and he told us that the next edition of Black's Law Dictionary would carry the, direct, the correct definition, which is that a person is an entity with the capacity to possess either rights or duties. In other words, you don't need to be able to have the capacity to bear duties in order to be the beneficiary of rights. So, but even if the, that court had been right, they never told us why, why or why the ability to bear legal responsibilities should have anything whatsoever to do with whether an autonomous being such as a chimpanzee should have the fundamental right to bodily liberty that Hague's purpose was created to, to protect. What does that have to do with, you can't enslave somebody because they can't bear duties. How do those things relate to each other? The court simply used that one sentence and never bothered to tell us. Worse, when the Non-Human Rights Project filed a motion imploring the next appellate court we went on in front of New York to and just read the correspondence between the Non-Human Rights Project and the editor-in-chief of Black's Law Dictionary, so it would not make the same mistake. That court actually denied our motion, refused to read the correspondence, and made the same mistake. So, again, we pointed out that millions of New Yorkers lack the capacity to bear duties, but they still possess fundamental rights. And this court just replied straight out, and they said, and this was their entire argument, this court, this argument that we're making ignores the fact that these are human beings. Again, they offer no clue as to why the fact that they're human beings must necessarily lead, necessarily lead to the conclusion that chimpanzees may not possess the fundamental right to bodily liberty protected by a writ of habeas corpus. Similarly, and this just happened to us last month, and we're currently seeking a further review of that, or actually reconsideration, a Connecticut trial court ignored the mass of unrebutted evidence that we put in front of them uh, that elephants are autonomous beings, and they dismissed our habeas corpus claim because they said they could not be entitled to the right to fundamental, to, to bodily liberty because our argument, and I quote, was relying upon basic human rights of freedom and equality, unquote. And that was the entire argument. And the court, just to make sure we got it, italicized the word human for us so we understood what our mistake was. But it made no further explanation as to why that could possibly be significant. So these sorts of distinctions without differences ignore the fact of how social justice progresses in the courts. That demands for personhood and legal rights of such, uh, such others as black people in the United States, Chinese, other marginalized and exploited humans, who the courts may view as non-white, necessarily had to rely and build upon the pre-existing basic rights of white humans. They didn't seem to, they ignored the fact that the demands of women for personhood and legal rights necessarily relied upon the pre-existing and built upon the pre-existing legal rights of men. The demands of gay people necessarily relied upon and built upon the pre-existing rights of heterosexuals. Similarly, the demands of non-human animals for personhood and legal rights must necessarily rely upon and build upon the pre-existing basic rights of human animals. So courts sometimes do feel that being required to endure the incessant frustration of the most fundamental interests that being a slave uh, that, that the non-human animals are causes them to suffer terribly. And their consciences may speak to be eased by the 
accepting arguments that are sometimes made by the other side or by friends of the court that the existing patchwork of anti-cruelty statutes and unenforceable welfare regulations are adequate to protect their fundamental interests, or they can somehow be made adequate. So the Connecticut trial court uh, that said that, uh, sorry, you can't build the rights of non-humans on the rights of humans, they gave us a break by pointing to that state's cruelty to animals law, and they said, they said that, that's a potential alternative method of ensuring the well-being of, an, of, any, animal, of any animal. And the New York appellate court said that, hey, don't worry, our rejection of a rights paradigm for animals doesn't leave them defenseless, and they listed a bunch of other you know, useless anti-cruelty and, um, and, and welfare jurisdictions. But these kinds of statutes and regulations are plainly inadequate on their own, and their inadequacy on their own can never be remedied. But they were enacted not to protect the well-being of human animals, of non-human animals, but they were, to, they were enacted to regulate the manner in which we and we humans exploit them. Now, human beings also are protected by regulations and, 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 uh, and statutes, welfare statutes. But the foundation of our legal protection of our most fundamental interests are rights that are supplemented by these regulations and statutes. The regulations and statutes themselves are woefully inadequate and always will woefully, will be woefully inadequate to protect the fundamental interests of humans without legal rights. They can never a human's strictly legal rights. So imagine that you're a human being who doesn't have any legal rights. You just have an anti cruelty statute. You would not feel yourself protected. Now <clears throat> fourth the fourth category is that some courts don't want to even think about the arguments that we're making. And accordingly what they do is they don't bother saying sorry, they're not humans, or rights are only humans. What they do is they try to find a way of dismissing our case without ever having to reach the merits of the case, or even to hear our arguments. To the point of ignoring their own rules and their determination to refuse personhood to non-human animals. So that Connecticut trial court I talked about said that the non-human rights project lacked standing, and in seven cases we had brought, that was the first time that any court had ever said that we lack standing to bring a habeas corpus case on behalf, this time of three elephants, who were work, forced to work in a traveling circus, because that court said that we were failed to explicitly allege that the elephants lacked significant relationships with somebody who could bring a writ of habeas corpus against the, the, against the people who run the circus. It doesn't even make sense to say that elephants lack those kinds of significant relationships. Like, you're in a circus, do you think they have a significant relationship with the tiger, or maybe the bear? They have no significant relationships with anyone who can bring a habeas corpus case. No. They're it. Uh, this, this court even went to the extent of noting that the jailers, that the people who run the zoo, might be analogous to their parents. And they might have a significant relationship, which was even stunning to us. And we pointed out that they don't, obviously. They're their masters. They're not their parents. But that even if they did, they would not be bringing a lawsuit against themselves because they're, they had adverse interests to themselves. Uh, in New York, this is primarily taken the form of interfering with our right to appeal. So when one trial, New York trial courts uh, illegally refused to rule on a motion that we, that we needed to allow us to appeal, we had to actually file what's a very unusual called a a mandamus in a higher court, which means that when a higher court sees that a lower court is doing something is not, or, or, or a public official is not doing her duty, we demand by filing a written mandamus that you order the lower court to rule on our motion, which is their duty to rule on motions. So within a week, that appellate court did set a hearing date on our request, and suddenly the lower court then ruled on our motion and allowed us to appeal. Another New York appellate court dismissed our appeal within a, a day or two after, a few days after we filed it. We didn't get to brief our case, there was no hearing, and they claimed that we had no right to appeal at all. 
We knew they were wrong, but we decided not to appeal, but simply to refile our case somewhere else. Then when a second appellate court also refused our right to appeal, at that point, our patience expired, and we filed a motion demanding that that court grant us the right to appeal, to which we are entitled. And then we began to move into the twilight zone. So we filed a motion uh, demanding the right to appeal, which we have, to a single judge of that court, and that judge said, no, we don't have the right. We then sought a hearing in front of the five judges of that court, and they all agreed we didn't have a right to appeal. We knew they were wrong. So then we brought another mandamus, but realized in New York we couldn't bring it to a higher court. So at least for the first time in my life, we brought a writ of mandamus in front of the court itself, demanding that it order itself to do its public duty and hear our appeal as a matter of right. And to our near astonishment, that court then essentially did order itself to do its duty and reversed all the previous decisions and, and agreed that we, we have the right of appeal. And more than half of the trial courts that were in the jurisdiction in which we filed suit have simply refused to even grant us the uh, grant of the hearing. Um, one New York appellate court then dismissed our case saying that a chimpanzee client could not even invoke the writ of habeas corpus because we were asking that it not that he be moved, removed from one place of confinement, living by himself in a cage inside of a storefront in Niagara Falls, to another alleged place of confinement, living on a five-acre island in the sun in South Florida with 24 other chimpanzees. As if the court would have ruled in our favor if we had asked that he not be moved to a sanctuary, but that we asked that he be released in Times Square. Now, even when changes, even when demands for legal, legal change such as we make are based upon scientific discovery, and every week there's more scientific discovery coming down on non-human animals showing that they are extraordinarily more cognitively complex than we might ever have thought. Even when, we are, when our demands are based on the top-notch scientific evidence, the evolution in public morality, which we can sometimes show by um, uh, but by the fact that uh, we have thousands of, of, uh, of people who write about us, uh, there's been over a hundred articles and books written, written about our work, uh, there are um, surveys that show that most people are beginning to agree with our arguments. Even when you make those kinds of arguments, when you are dealing with, with a kind of law that's been in effect for 2,000 years, we will inevitably encounter strong headwinds at the beginning. You know, for no legal exploitation that has existed for 2,000 years, it's going to be changed without a titanic struggle. And that's the kind of struggle we're in. But the long and the painful struggle, you know, for the person with the legal rights of other human groups, like human slaves, women, children, um, indigenous peoples, gay people, and other traditionally disenfranchised human groups, would demonstrate that catalyzing a gestalt shift in judges from a thing to a person demands a clear and unshakable long-term strategy with smart and a flexible tactics, effective networking, a broadening political base, and perhaps most importantly, sheer persistence in the face of multiple rejections. So the work of the Non-Human Rights Project today then is to persist in catalyzing visual imaginations by bringing this increasing scientific discovery to the attention of the judges, and importantly, in giving them the opportunities to vindicate their own proud ideals of justice by recognizing that at least some non-human animals, certainly those that the Non-Human Rights Project experts can prove are autonomous, should be legal persons entitled to such basic fundamental rights as bodily liberty and bodily integrity. So I go back to the, the stories that sometimes uh, we see in the newspaper. Oh, we won this, we lost that. And we're saying that that does not I mean, come anywhere near capturing the story that's going on. And so in, in our struggle for non-human rights, which is still in its early years, we're just hit four years, that the non-human rights project real stories will not be did we win or did we lose any case or any series of cases. Instead, our stories will necessarily 
mirror the stories that tell how humans, so long disenfranchised and so long extremist injustice, how they found champions who were determined to fight on their behalf, and how they harnessed the impersonal forces of their time to win. And so the non-human rights project stories, like their stories, will be tales of fights to win the battles, and all the numerous skirmishes that rage within every social justice lawsuit that are not so easily apparent, especially not the lawyers, but often determine the outcomes. Uh, of it. And then we have to learn to savor our victories. It will be stories of lessons to learn from, from our defeats. But most of all, it will be stories of unshakable persistence. Because we believe from such is history made. Thank you. Someone speaking. There is a microphone, I understand, yes? So please indicate. Gotcha. Please indicate if you have a question to ask. And if you have a question, please be short so that we can get as many questions in as possible and that Steve can answer them as well. No one has a question? Well, uh, in my experience, when no one has a question, either I was incredibly clear or no one has any idea what I was talking about. Oh, we do have a question. There's a microphone coming down to you, Christine. <laughs> okay. Hi, Steve. It's Christine Dorchak, also from Boston area. How are you doing? Christine. I hope you're well, wonderful to see you. <laughs> um, I could ask you a question to hopefully show people that. Um, exemplify a little bit some of the wonderful work that you've done and probably what keeps you going. Can you talk to us about a case that you've won that's helped motivate you to keep fighting for animals? Well, so far, the, the closest we have been able to come to win in the United States um, is the, uh, the case that you see um, in in, in un unlocking the cage. Um, by the way, I'm not so clear, so, so sure that it's not related to the fact that of this, of the, uh, I think, six or seven trial judges who we've argued in front of, we've only been in front of one woman, and that woman, head and shoulders, you know, wrote the most thoughtful decision, and we came closer to being to, to win our case. That's the one in which you can see in the film unlocking the cage. So, in that case, for the very first time, the, a judge actually issued the writ of habeas corpus. Um, in, in New York, you can have either a writ of habeas corpus under the statute, or you can file, you can ask for what's called an order to show cause. So, a writ of habeas corpus means that the jailer has to come into court and bring the the, uh, the prisoner. We really did not want the chimpanzees to be brought to court. So the judge issued the order to show cause, which meant for the first time in history, somebody, and this was Stony Brook University, uh, was required to come into court and face us and face the judge and give a legally sufficient reason for why they think they're allowed to imprison a chimpanzee. And I think that argument lasted for about two hours. It was heavily covered by a media. Um, the judge then wrote a lengthy decision and to essentially agree with virtually everything we said, um, uh, uh, including um, dismissing some of the arguments, for example, uh, the uh, slippery slope argument, which is the argument, uh, hey judge, if you give rights to chimpanzees, then tomorrow you're going to have to give rights to cows and sheep, and we're all going to have to be them the day after that. Um, that's not meaning, uh, I'm not the non-human rights project doesn't argue about that either way in court, but the way the other side argues against this is it tries to stop the first non-human animals from being moved from the thing side of the wall to the person side of the wall by arguing that if you move one, you're going to have to move them all. And we argue, no, we're here to move one. We'll 
you know, on another day, we'll come in to talk about another, on another day, another. And the judge agreed. She said, I, it's, a, it's a party in front of me, which is that chimpanzee. If he's entitled to, to uh, legal rights, then by golly, he will get it. And the reason he didn't get it was that she felt that as a lower court, that she was bound by a decision by a higher court in another part of the state of New York. We argued that she was not bound by it, but we lost that argument. And so uh, that was the reason we lost, is that she found that, felt that she was bound by another, another um, uh, higher court. But she made it clear in her decision that if she had not been bound, it was likely that indeed she would have issued the little pages for this. So those kinds of cases really energize us. But you know, to be honest, um, we we are going we're, we're going to start winning our cases and, and animal I'm human animals are, are going to get rights and we understand that it's not easy to change two thousand years of of uh, and non human animals of not having rights and so it's going to take a while to educate judges they're going to have to begin to understand the power of our legal argument and the power of our facts um, we that is slowly happening and. Um, uh, we're actually non-discourageable. Uh, we intend to move ahead because we understand that our facts are excellent and our legal arguments are powerful. And if judges rule against us, uh, we'll, we'll give them another chance and another chance after that and another chance after that. Okay. Thank you, Steve. There is time for one more very brief question and a very brief answer. Jonathan? No, not Jonathan, I'm sorry. Hi, Stephen. Uh, what do you see as the potential for legislative change as opposed to courtroom change, if you could make such a distinction? Are there any legislations in the United States that you feel are on the verge of making, creating law that would um, promote change in the direction that you see? Um, we do, actually. Um, we have uh, brought on a campaign director recently, uh, like uh, last week, <laughs> whose job is now to begin to begin going to certain municipalities in states in which uh, we're trying to argue that a city council can enact an ordinance that would allow uh, non-human animals to be legal persons with certain rights within within their municipalities. So we're going to begin starting at the municipal level. Um, I didn't mention the fact that we're also working with um, uh, legal groups in, I don't know, 12, 14, 15 countries on every continent right now in South Africa. Uh, and some of those uh, legal groups believe it's better in their country to take the legislative rather than, rather than a litigation approach. And so we are actually working with them uh, to help them make the legislative um, approach, just like we're working with the other countries who want to file lawsuits. And so um, once the first major breakthrough keep coming one by one in courtrooms, and they're going to happen, legislatures are going to jump in you know, all over the place. Um, if only to try to reverse some of those victories. And you know, in that way, we actually um, model ourselves on the gay marriage of, of, uh, history in the United States where that happened. And indeed, uh, there's one very well-known advocate for gay marriage, Evan Wilson, who, who gives uh, generously up his time and we work with him uh, to try to understand how we might be able to learn lessons from the 25-year-old fight for gay marriage in the United States and how we might be able to apply that to you know, our, our ongoing fight uh, for the uh, to, for the personhood of the fundamental legal rights of the uh, Steve, thank you very much for that answer. And I think now, is, uh, before I say that, is there any more questions? No. Okay, well, Steve, thank you very much for being able to be with us uh, via Skype for this past hour. Um, I think that everyone got a lot out of the presentation, and, uh, and, and I think everyone wants to uh, express their appreciation as well. Thank you. Thank you. It's a wonderful conference. Okay, well, Steve, we'll see you around. Yes, yes, sir. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.